You're watching Global Trade This Week with Pete Mento and Doug Draper. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Global Trade This Week brought to you by Cap Logistics. I am Pete Mento, and I am joined this week and every week by my good friend, colleague, and co-host, Mr. Doug Draper. Doug, how are you, buddy? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, doing great on this uh, uh, Monday morning. How about yourself? Good, man. I'm good. I'm uh, coming off of an epic day-long hangover. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's nice. It's nice to feel better. I don't really drink like I used to. You know, I, I, at one point I was almost a Belushi-esque character, but um, between being on a diet and getting what can only be classified as too old to party, I'm just, uh, I'm not built for that kind of behavior anymore, buddy. Yeah, I think you're more like a Patrick Swayze-esque type of mantra right now so yeah I, I i don't think i'm uh i don't think i could i don't think i could compete with the sways man i don't think i've got what it takes i don't think yeah, i've got what it takes I yeah i've got some moves like swayze yes yeah 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 i can move like swayze yeah we'll save that for another show i don't think i want to see that but yeah we might have to well why don't we kick it off uh you you uh you you won the toss and you elected to receive this week so why don't you go yeah. ahead and get started Cool. Well, I'm taking the flip side. This one's all about ocean freight, which has been a lot of conversation and, and discussion, but I'm kind of taking the opposite approach, focused on the export uh, specific to the United States and what's happening with uh, exporting out of the U.S. specific to agriculture. So um, basically, here's the gist of it, is that traditionally agriculture products, soybeans, grain, things of that nature, Super easy way for the ocean containers to kind of get a backhaul, right? Nobody's trying to make any money. The commodities don't really have a whole lot of value, but they usually have a lot of volume. So what an amazing combination to get containers repositioned over into um, uh, the Asian uh, markets, right? So um, obviously the containers are making a lot of money on the inbound and the agriculture industry is suffering. So Essentially, as you know, right, I mean, here's, here's the, the quick and dirty. Nobody wants containers to come inland because the faster you can get the product off and get them the hell back over to Asia, the more money you're going to make, right? And so to have a container come from California on a rail into Denver or Chicago, then down to a farm in Iowa onto a truck that's in the middle of nowhere to load up a handful of, of, uh, of commodities to go back out of the country, I mean, that's a two- two and a half week cycle, right? So forget that. So what's happened is they're just shutting it off. They're not letting containers go inland. Uh, the agriculture industry is, is suffering and it's, it's slow turn stuff. So um, the hell are they gonna do, right? So in the research that I've done, a lot of farmers are trying to look for uh, alternative sources, like where else am I gonna sell my stuff, mm -hmm. right? So you could hit that domestically, uh, North American markets, uh, things that don't even have to touch an ocean container. Um, so that's one option. Other option is go to alternative ports. But again, everybody's chasing the same solution to the same problem. Uh, and as we've talked about in previous shows, um, you know, going to an alternative or second tier port isn't as easy as it sounds. And when everybody's chasing that solution, um, it, it doesn't work. So that's not really an option. Uh, and then obviously you can go to the legislative routes and start talking to the government about the farm bill and what they can do to be protected. And I think ultimately uh, it may go that route. And so what do I mean by that is I think the long-term implication is nobody's talking about it right now because we are in the roaring 20s. Everybody wants to consume, consume, consume. Nobody's thinking about the farmer and the exports that are suffering. So what's going to happen, Pete? Uh, after Labor Day, things are going to go on and they're going to talk about the harvest season is over and there's going to be all of this inventory, all this agricultural inventory that's going to be here in the U.S., not where it's supposed to be. Um, perishable is a common phrase with agriculture. Um, and there's going to be some stories written about how the farmer's gotten screwed in this one. Nobody's thought about it. Uh, it'll be kind of an afterthought until harvest season is over. And then um, there'll be some adjustments and some uh, legislation to take care of the farmer uh, and that group of people that have suffered for, from the Roaring Twenties and the insane consumption of the United States and not wanting containers to come, to come, uh, to come inbound. So that's my take. It, it's the unsilent 
or not on silent, it's the silent situation that's happening with our agriculture industry and the impact of containers. We won't hear a lot about it until after Labor Day, but um, let it be known that here on Global Trade This Week, we're the first ones to tell you it will become a topic, it will become an issue, and it will be talked about a lot after Labor Day. So that's my take on the flip side of the uh, ocean container um, crisis that we're in. Well, I'm going to add to that, Doug, because I think that there is also a geopolitical international relations component in that the, uh, the Chinese did not live up to their, their agreement, right? You know, we've talked about this before. In the phase one agreement that we signed with the Chinese, there was, there was a, um, there was an assumption that they were going to follow through with 1.5 to $2 billion a year worth of, uh, of, of consumption of things like pork. I mean, there was, there was, billions and billions of dollars of American agriculture that was supposed to be exported overseas via ocean container. And of course, because of COVID, well, that didn't happen. So a lot of that backlog, of course, falls apart. The Biden administration is, is doing their best to show the world that they're tough on China and tough on Russia. But when it comes time to sit down and really begin to renegotiate trade matters, Job number one is going to be re-executing these agriculture agreements. They're probably going to put that, mm -hmm. for a lot of the reasons you just talked about, they're going to put that before what they really should be doing, which is paying attention to IP problems. So maybe there'll be all, an almost roaring 20s-like run on export containers to get sorghum and soybean and frozen chicken and pork across the ocean. I don't know. But I think there will be uh, chickens coming home to roost on this one. But uh, I think that you're right. You know, past, past harvest season – going deep into the winter next year, there's going to be some action on it. It's going to take legislative uh, work to make that happen. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There's going to be, you know, a glutton of product. There's going to be um, product in market that's going to expire and go bad. And, and, you know, and you can, soybeans and all that kind of stuff, you can uh, extend the shelf life. But what's going to happen is going to be so much of that product here. The prices are going to go down. There's going to be tons of food that's going to be, um, you know, destroyed, basically, and uh, it's going to be a shame. So Agreed. different perspectives, agreement on the topic for sure. Yep. All right, Pete, fire away. What's your uh, number one topic for today? Well, uh, I guess it's only a matter of time before we, the proletariat, rise up from, um, from our, our boxed Uber dinners, and kick in our television sets and begin to burn down the homes of the ultra wealthy in America. Given the news that happened last week that practically every billionaire in this country apparently paid absolutely no taxes. Um, for those of you who were not paying attention to the news, because, hey, why would you? Uh, there was a report that came out, um, a number of credible news services, where the tax information of the wealthiest Americans was released. And what we learned was that for most of them, Mr. Bezos, of course, Zuckerberg, the list goes on and on, Elon Musk, we're taking um, loans against their assets in the form of their stock. And then, of course, um, those loans were not taxable events. And they're able to essentially live their lives on loans against the assets of their company quite well, as you know. What's even more concerning is when they pass away and they die, these assets, um, these, these taxable revenue events are not taxable to their offspring. So they're going to be avoiding most of the wealth tax. What does it have to do with global trade? It has a lot to do with global trade, and here's why. We are always talking about taxing the rich. We're always talking about taxing American corporations. What we all need to understand is that there are very wealthy people who are always going to employ very smart people, the kind of people I've always worked with, who are going to find ways to look for loopholes around taxable events, or to look for ways for loopholes to not pay tariffs, look for ways around loopholes to not pay federal income tax. When I was just a wee trade nerd, right, living in a basement office, I mean, just absolutely worthless. Nobody cared about me. I was just a, a billable asset. I worked on transfer pricing, and all I did was try to make sure that just enough profit for an American company stayed on just enough of these other countries that they were able to be taxed in the lowest possible tax jurisdiction at the lowest possible amount. It takes a lot of money to get there, which is why wealthy companies are always going to have the power to get what they want when it comes to global trade. Don't expect that to change anytime soon. So as we watch things like the infrastructure bill and as we watch things like the new budget coming out of Washington, D.C., 
meet the new boss, same as the old boss. It's going to be a nothing burger, my friends. Nothing but a nothing burger. Get as excited as you want. Yeah. Nothing's changing. Yeah. Well, we haven't had a, uh, a musical reference in a while, and The Who is no better one yeah. uh, to, to insert. I, I, ironically, I was listening to that song with my son. I came on the radio, and I'm like, you got to listen to this one. So oh, yeah. I love it. I love the, uh, the Who reference. And I, think, I think you it, uh, nailed it with very extremely wealthy people employ very smart individuals, and they'll always, in my opinion, and you mentioned it, find a way around the system and you know, tax the one percent or whatever, and everybody pays their fair share. You know that second tier down uh, affluency. You know the guy that's making ten, twenty million dollars uh, that's being taxed as far as income. They're going to get hit. But these these megatron uh, folks that you just referenced. You're right. They got super. <laughs> they'll find a way around it. You know, uh, uh, referencing the who. So yeah. agreed. Problems I wish we had, Doug. Really, you know, and that uh, that, that brings yeah. us to halftime. I know I don't have stock assets I can borrow against yet. You know, maybe someday, Doug. Maybe someday. Yeah, yeah. So, well, hey, two. I'll jump in. Two. I got two things. One that's kind of fun. I was thinking about. So the Ever Given, right? That was the uh, the Evergreen vessel that was stuck in the Suez Canal, yep. and like anything else, it's the shiny rock of media. What's going on? And that made press for probably two weeks, but. I don't know if people know, but that sucker and that vessel is still no. in the Suez Canal. Uh, and um, the latest the latest on that is the 900 million that was initially asked for. I think it's down to like 550 million. Oh, and it's a plethora of lawyers and insurance and all. I mean, I don't know when it's going to go. And meanwhile, there's stuff on that boat. And we talked about uh, agriculture. I mean, I can't even imagine. There, the fruit, the food, I mean, oh, it's crazy. It, it's never ending. So my point in the halftime there is that um, it's not over. It's still sitting there baking in the Egyptian sun of the summer. And um, it's uh, something I came across the other day, and I thought I'd just bring it up. That's just awful. I, I, yes, I, it is. I've been in those situations. I was a marine surveyor that helped pay the bills back when I was so – I had to do way too many jobs, man. You know, back in Baltimore, yeah. I, I remember opening up, having to be there to open up a container that used to be frozen fish that had been on the Baltimore dock for like two months. And it, it wasn't pleasant, man. So I can only think about what's yeah. probably on there. But imagine if you're, you're in a supply chain situation, you've been waiting for this stuff forever, and it's not there, you know? And it seems like every week we have some sort of a, of a reminder and a refresher of just how broken supply chains are because of what's going on with ocean freight. And there's a grand example. But this one is it's almost like being held for ransom. Just five hundred million, Doug. You can write up a check. Yeah, it's a big deal. Yeah. Five hundred million. Yeah. Well that's why you need you need an, you don't need insurance until you need it, right? So I'm sure all those folks are just insurance, I paid my premium, scratch me a check and I've moved on and then you have Fifteen thousand containers full of crap. You got to figure out what you're going to do with as soon as it gets released. I need this. So. I need this year to end again. I thought 2020 was bad. We're halfway through this one. It's mm. Every time I turn around, it's another disaster. And that brings me to my final topic this week. Uh, yeah, rip it, Doug. I know you hate drones. I know you can't stand them. All right. I do. All right. Now drones. Yes. Drones are EVs. For those of you who don't know what an EV is, it's an electric vehicle. I know that there are gas-powered drones, but I've never been around one. They are electric, these drones. But um, electric drones, not really a problem. Those things sell like crazy. They're being made pretty quickly. They're hard to find right now, Doug. I spent some time online trying to find one for you because I hope that maybe I could, I could sway you to the side of the century and maybe make you a positive drone guy. You know, maybe maybe we, he could come out and get some footage of the two of us racing drones when I come out to Colorado, maybe, who knows. But more importantly, where EVs do have a footing in America right now is in the car world. And if you've been paying attention to you know, the automotive press, we're all watching this tipping point that appears to be happening with the American consumer truly adopting the idea of hybrids and EVs, plug-ins specifically. The problem that we're beginning to see now is many, 
of these companies are folding before their first car hits the road. Uh, in America in particular, we're seeing many, many companies who are having a hard time getting those first cars done. What does this have to do with trade? Well, what Doug was just talking about. A lot of these companies had tremendous investment, great ideas, awesome operations, but now the supply chain is so backed up, they can't get chips, they can't get raw materials, they can't get the things that get stuffed inside the car, so they can't get the cars finished, which means they can't get their cars on the road, which means they can't get cash in the door, which means they can't continue to innovate and manufacture. We're actually beginning to see an effect and an impact on American technical innovation because we can't get these damn ships out of port. It's madness. But don't worry, Doug. Mm -hmm. Drones, no problem. They're making plenty of those. But good luck getting your electric, uh, you know, your electric pickup truck or electric motorcycles or these new generations of electric cars that are being made in America. They're having a hard time rolling them out of the plant because they can't get the ships in with all the parts. Yeah. Well, first and foremost, you're never going to get that wasted time that you spent trying to find a drone. You're never getting that back. So um, I giggled the whole time. To you, stop. I was on Amazon giggling the whole time, just giggling, trying to think about. You sitting there stomping on it in your driveway like stupid Pete. I hate this thing. So that was that was well worth it for yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. So I I agree one hundred percent on that. I would say um, proof of concept. I guess it, it, it's what I believe is some of it to to go out there. Is you get what I mean by that is you have a, a very charismatic leader that's aligned themselves with a lot of money and another brand that they may be partnering with and they have a good folly and a good show and they're good on stage and it's kind of there, it's kind of not. And you know, it's that, um, that scene from Ferris Bueller when he was calling in and he was acting like his dad to get Sloan out of school <laughs> and you know, and the principal's running around and she's whatever. So they're trying to maintain control but it's total chaos behind the scenes. So I think a lot of these um, startups have some of that flavor uh, with them is that, yeah, let's do a, a, a semi truck and let's make it electric and it sounds good and let's align ourselves with some other brands that have recognition and see what happens. And all of a sudden it starts to tank, there's problems and the leader rejects with a pocket full of money. And if you wanna see an amazing documentary, I can't remember the name of it, but it, and maybe it was called WeWork, I don't know, everybody knows what WeWork is, but there was this documentary I saw about the founder of WeWork and pretty much what, what he did and the amazing journey he went on. And he's no longer at WeWork, but he's got about 200 million bucks and he's just hanging out. So I think some of it is proof of concept and you're catching a, a wave that everybody wants to believe in. Um, and some of that is there. So yeah, the supply chain affects everything, but I still think some of that is just general proof of concept and people are getting a little, ahead of the, uh, over their skis, if you will, on um, implementation of some of these ideas. Doug, I can't wait to buy you your own drone that you can drive your EV to a field to to practice with. And, uh, you know, maybe from there, we'll do some TikTok videos of it. And, um, you know, maybe mm -hmm. watch some anime after, get some boba tea, see just how millennial you and I can get, man. Let's get weird with it. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Well, I can tell you for a fact that tapioca is on uh, on on the hit list because my daughter cannot find boba tea anyway and anywhere, and that that's her thing. So See? I don't know about the boba tea, and I'll have to drag the electric truck because it's not in form that, and and the drone will just fall out of the sky and waste everybody's time. So yeah. that's my take on you that. You are an angry little elf, aren't you, Doug? That, I don't know. What, yeah, I don't know what the drone did. One like smack into you when you were skiing or something. You really hate those things. No, no. It's the bike rides I've been taking lately. Hey, um, so here's my last topic on it, and it's it's you know we did, last week we I think 75% of what we talked about was political in nature, and so the good news is only 50% of what I'm talking about this week is political. And I know enough to be dangerous in that realm, so I'll kind of keep it short. But I read that the Biden administration is going to establish a supply chain distribution task force that's going to focus on semiconductors. Uh, large capacity batteries for uh, electric vehicles, pharmaceuticals and pharmaceutical ingredients, and critical minerals and materials, which is about as broad of a topic as you could possibly come up with. So the way, the gist that I got of this sucker is that, you know, there's a problem, so let's generate a task force to analyze it, which to me is like the cat's out of the bag, right? I, I get it, but you can't 
fix things in the rears through legislation. So, you know, the global trade this week part of it is that I think these guys should be focused on severed, uh, uh, incentives, leveraging policies, and talking about things they can set in stage so in the future this won't happen again if they want to develop policies and procedures, which is right up your alley, and you can speak very much more to this. But, hey, there was a problem, so let's fix it by developing a task force and analyze what already happened when the U.S. just wants to fix what's something in the future, right? So let's take the U.S. government, focus their efforts on fixing what won't happen again rather than a task force to do whatever they're going to do because nothing's going to come of it. Yeah, this is Pete, I'm dabbling. I, I'm, I'm putting my big toe in your world big time. So what's your take on that? Well, there's been some great task force, Doug, in the past. There was the task force on on dog food contamination. We've had, you know, we've had task force um, on, on all kinds of things that were presidential task force, you know, that they're mostly done so that a report can be generated, usually done as a joint venture with a, a consulting firm. Hey, I think, you know, Doug, I have a consulting firm. The White House could call me. You and I could do this together. We could probably charge them the 2 to $3 million of time that will probably get put towards this to generate a couple hundred pounds of paper that absolutely nobody will read because the U.S. government is not in the business of actually fixing any of this. The profit margin will, the profit standard. People trying to actually make money and get goods where they need to be will figure out a way to do this. What the government needs to do is clear the way through regulations to let them do that, A. And then B, low interest loans, uh, grants, uh, doing everything they can to help create better infrastructure. You think this report's going to do that? No, absolutely not. It's going to be a nice big piece of paper so that the Biden administration can say what they need to say, which is, we did something. I did something. You know, we did a report, we found out a great deal, and now if we're reelected, we can do something about it. It would take three, four maybe even, eight-term presidents to actually get something done here, Doug. It's going to take a long time to fix the mess that we're in right now, and it's going to need a lot more than some stupid paper to make that happen. So do I think it's great that they're all coming and paying attention? Sure. But are they going to invite people from industry to actually do something? Or are we going to have a bunch of policy wonks? And people with MBAs and supply chain telling us how to fix this because that will be an utter waste of time. It's like when my daughter came home from physics and tried to teach me about U.S. government. Kind of wanted to put her through a wall. So I don't see a whole lot from this happening that's positive other than maybe some more focus on it. But honestly, uh, Doug, I thought about this. It's, um, you know, it's like every fall when we see all the pink um, ribbons for breast cancer. I think we're all aware of the problem. I'd be a whole lot happier learning about how we're going to fix it. Yeah, you can't legislate to prosperity, and that's just, uh, I, I loved your comment about <clears throat> hundreds of pages of, of paper. So, Pete, on the way out, before we exit, I got to tell our audience here on uh, a week, Sunday, June 20th, which is this coming weekend, I'm involved with something called Bike for Alzheimer's, Bike 4, the number 4, Alls, ALZ. So I will be riding 82 miles on my bike from Denver to Colorado Springs. Now, some people don't think that's a big deal. I think it's a really big deal, and uh, I may be in, uh, in crutches come next Monday, but I wanted to give a shout-out to that group, bikeforalls.org, if you have any interest in participating. Just some friends that I know that have a passion and a purpose behind it, so I wanted to give, uh, give two shouts well, let's out. make sure we get that link up. I know that I'll be donating, and um, I, I don't think we've ever asked anyone to donate to a charity before. I hope everybody else does as well. No. Alzheimer's has touched my life in many ways, and I'm sure it's touched many of yours as well. So if you would please consider donating to this cause, and hopefully Doug does not have a cardiac arrest, and we have him again next year, or next week, excuse me, um, on the show. I, God bless you, man. I, I don't I don't want to ride my motorcycle for 80-something miles, so good for you, buddy. Yeah, well. Do um, you have anything else going on, saying that. On, the, on, the, on the professional side before we cut out of here? No. Well, um, uh, no, I, I will be. That's about it. What about I'm you? I'm kind of excited for this one. Uh, I will be a moderator uh, for the Economist magazine. They are doing their Global Trade Week on the 28th of June through the 2nd of July. I will be moderating uh, one of their focus panels on um, cyber. So I'll be moderating a panel panel on cyber crime and um, the susceptibility of it in the maritime industry and what should probably be done to help um, find some way 
some meaningful way to give us some more resilient maritime industry against cyber attacks. I'm being uh, joined by my very good friend, Captain Alex Ohanoff, who is the, um, he was a partner with his new venture, True North Cybersecurity. Uh, True North um, is a cybersecurity firm that focuses almost entirely on port cybersecurity, maritime cybersecurity, and um, the residency of supply chain cybersecurity. I'm extremely proud of him and his partners and what they're doing. Guy's a true patriot, and he has really put his money where his mouth is. And this is going to be one very cool panel. So I'll make sure we get the link out for it. It's free. The Economist is not charging for this, and the content is amazing. Like mm. I'm speaking after Catherine Tai, the USTR, like the the head negotiator for the for the WTO, is on it. And then there's like Pete Malix. You know, it's like I think they ran out of people to ask to talk, Doug, and they're like, "Can we?" Can we get someone else in here? Let's call Mento up. I'm sure he's not busy. Like, I, honestly, I don't know. They ran out of celebrities. And it's sort of like when you're watching one of those TV shows and somebody from Survivor eight seasons ago is a B-list celebrity. That's kind of how I feel being on this thing. But I'm incredibly honored. and I can't wait to do it. Mm. Well, that's, yeah, that is very cool. And I'm glad the link will show everybody where they could uh, participate and join. So the question I have, are you going to have a suit on? Are you going to wear a baseball cap? What's the what's the dress? What's the attire? I'm an economist, bro, and it's for the economist. I will 100 percent have a jacket on, like a like I'm like a button up right. collar. I've lost enough weight now where I think I can wear my old you know my old uh, tailored suit. So I'm not, I'm gonna look like an adult. You know, I might even get rid of my Sturgill Simpson posters behind me and let everyone see my bald shiny head for this one. There you go. Yeah. Well, make sure the shirts fit. You don't want to be that guy or that 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 high school kid that's never worn a tie before, you know, and his shirt's so far out and he gets all tucked up. But Pete, that is not you. That's not what's going to happen. And I know uh, the group and our audience will love to love to learn more about it. So thanks for mentioning. Good luck on your ride, buddy. So with that, sincerely, no kidding aside, and thank you for doing that. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much. And with that, we'll just uh, eject for this week. As you know, everybody, uh, 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 Cap Logistics runs the show, caplogistics.com for all your transportation logistics need. We wouldn't be here without them. We'll get Keenan on sooner than later. Um, you can get a taste of what the man, the myth, the legend's all about. Yeah. So until next week on the 21st of June, Pete, good luck this week. Good Appreciate luck, it. And we'll see all of you on Peace. Monday. All right. Take care, guys.